there is a moment when the sun disappears, when darkness falls and you're left with just your fears. That's the moment you feel your first pang of doubt. That's the moment when the night comes out. Episode 7, Deranged, Part 1. Bo and Sherry are young lovers. That should be the start of a tender-hearted tale of dates and dreams and love. However, there's something wrong with Bo and Sherry. They have a powerful urge to kill. And they've been doing it for a week now. However, what these two don't know is that sometimes the world has nightmares even for spree killers. This is especially true when the night comes out. Well now, that was a fantastic meal. I must say, I've not had a meal like that in quite some time. I'd really want to thank you all for allowing us to eat such a fine plate of food with you folks. Bo Ivy dabbed at his mouth with a napkin, which he then tossed casually on the plate in front of him. The remains of the roast chicken, peas, and mashed potatoes caught it and immediately began soaking it with leftover gravy. He finished the beer next to the plate, put down the empty glass, and belched. Then he slid the chair back and stood up, reaching his full six and a half feet. Sherry, did you get enough to eat, hon? He stretched as he stood. They had been on the road for more than a week, and it felt good to stretch. We gotta get motoring, and I don't want you complaining about how hungry you are. Sherry looked over at him from the living room, smiled. I'm good, sweetie. Let's just finish this off and get on the road. Are you sure? We can sleep here once we're done down here, if you want to. Sherry shook her head. Nah, I don't like sleeping here once it's done. I want to get moving. Bo shrugged. Well, then, guess we better get on with it. Bo reached into his pocket and came out with a switchblade. He had owned this particular knife with the blue handle since he was 14. He was 21 now. In his left pocket was the 38 Sherry had taken from her father once they had finished killing her entire family, then got on the road. In his back pocket was the pistol he had taken from the man currently tied up and gagged on the easy chair in the living room, looking at him with wide, terrified eyes mumbling against the gag. Mr. Jameson. The name of the family had been on the mailbox at the end of the road, right by the driveway. Sherry had told him how hungry she was, and he admitted he was too. She also told him she really liked the house. They were getting good at this now, though, and had Mr. and Mrs. Jameson, their 16-year-old daughter and 11-year-old son, gagged and bound in the living room in less than 20 minutes. Sorry for interrupting your dinners, folks, but I do appreciate the food, Mrs. Jameson. Bo said, giving the bound and terrified family his most winning smile. I do appreciate your hospitality. He had more guns from the home, too. A pump-action shotgun Mr. Jameson had stashed in a closet. There was a deer hunting rifle, too. Bo and Sherry had collected quite a few since they started traveling about two weeks ago. Each place they visited, they seemed to find guns. It was amazing traveling in this part of the country, Bo mused. He pushed the button, and the knife snapped open. Now, Mr. Jameson, this is probably going to hurt, but just for a few seconds. Bo leaned in and quickly slit the man's throat from one side to the other, then back again, twisting the knife so the arteries opened and sprayed across the living room. The man began to kick his legs, twist and turn, gurgle and make noise. Bo smiled as he watched him. This was always the fun part. The last seconds, the weird pleading in the eyes. Sherry, please take care of the young missus. Bo commanded. Sherry turned the double-barreled shotgun toward the 16-year-old. This gun they had gotten from the first house they had visited right after killing her family. It was her favorite because the homeowner had cut it down slightly so his wife could use it. 
Sherry pulled the trigger. The side of the young girl's head vanished in a spray of blood and bone, which splattered against the white couch. (laughs) I love it when it splatters like that, baby, she cried out. Mr. Jameson's eyes had started to go blank. Bo held the gaze a moment longer, but he forced himself to turn away. There was work to do. He saw the young boy already trying to crawl away. The mother screamed against her gag, her eyes on them, then at her daughter's body. Shut her up, Sherry, Bo said. Sherry put the barrel of the gun against Mrs. Jameson's chest and fired, squealing with glee when her chest burst apart and more blood went flying. The girl really did love all of the blood. They had had sex in her family's blood right after they finished killing her younger brother two weeks ago. It was amazing. Since then, it was like they couldn't get enough. Sorry, young sir, Bo said, grabbing the boy by his hair. You ain't crawling away. Bo raised the knife again. Then he brought it down. He brought it down many, many times. Sherry climbed off of Bo, putting her panties back on as she collapsed in the passenger seat. The SUV was huge, and they had so much room. She had jumped on him the moment they transferred all the guns to the back of the vehicle and got inside. They were still in the Jameson's garage, both covered in blood. Bo had left streaks of blood from his hands and her hair. That was one of the best yet, Sherry said, the feral smile still on her face. The looks in their faces. They get so scared of us. I wish we didn't gag them because I love when they beg. Guess that's where we differ, little lady. Bo said, tucking himself back into his jeans. He started the engine and backed out of the driveway. I just like the quiet. I like the looks in their eyes, but I can do without the verbal pleading. Hey, should we see if our story's still on the news? Turn on the radio. Find a news update. Sherry turned on the radio and flipped to the AM band. She let the digital numbers roll through lots of political talk until they came to a news broadcast where the first thing she heard was her own name. Hey, there I am! She cried in delight. The police are still warning anyone in the states of Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico to be on the lookout of Bo Lively and his girlfriend Sherry Berlin. They are to be considered armed and extremely dangerous. Sherry laughed. They just don't know how true they are, right, hon? Right as rain. The broadcast continued. It's believed the couple murdered Berlin's entire family and went on the run. Police found her home outside of Las Vegas left as a bloody murder scene two weeks ago. It's believed the very next night, Lively murdered a gas station attendant, stealing money as he did so. The couple are wanted on five counts of first-degree murder and stolen property. Sherry laughed. They don't even have the numbers right. Bo nodded. What are we up to now? Well, there was my family, so that's four. Then the guy in the gas station, so that's five. We killed the young couple on the side of the road, so seven. Then we just offed four more, so we're up to eleven. Woo! They laughed, and Bo stepped on the gas. The SUV took a moment to get up to speed, but soon they were flying across the highway into the night. Two hours later, Bo found a spot far off the main road beneath a large overgrowth of trees. By then, Sherry was ready to go again, so they did. Once they finished, she curled up in the back seat and fell asleep. Bo stayed up, smoking a cigarette, staring out into the darkness and the night. He smiled at the darkness. He had long ago befriended it. How the hell had he gotten here? It had all happened so fast. The moment he met Sherry, his world had changed. All of the rats and spiders on his head quieted down. For once, he was sure he had found someone who understood him. Bo leaned back against the driver's seat and closed his eyes. He'd been working at a local mechanic shop. Just around the corner was the trailer park Sherry Berlin called home. It was her father who brought her over to the garage just three weeks ago. He needed repairs done on the car and knew the owner. 
Sherry, all of 15, immediately saw Bo. Bo saw her too, and he gave her his most winning smile. Oh, hello there, she said, chewing on her gum and smiling right back at him. You new around here? I just started here about three days ago. It was just that simple. Although he watched her father grab her by the arm and drag her away, she was soon sneaking away from the trailer, showing up at the garage to talk to Bo. I want to get out of here, she said one night. Why? Look at this place. It's all shit. My life is shit. My parents are shit. Bo stood up and wiped grease from his hands. Why do you say that? You have no idea what it's like to be with my father, what kind of man he is. But despite all that, don't you just want to see what else is out there? Bo played dumb. Out where? She punched him in the shoulder. The rest of the world! There's an entire planet out there, and we're stuck in the middle of Nevada. There's literally nothing here. Flat, boring, desert. Well, we get the hand we're dealt, and we have to play it. Sherry came in close, her hand very near his belt line. I think you can just change the hand, call for a new game. I don't have enough money, and I bet you don't either. Bo whispered. What would we live on? Sherry stepped away from him. Don't worry about it. I can get us money. It was a stupid and innocent conversation, but Bo couldn't get it out of his head. He'd come from a small town in Montana. His own father was a raging alcoholic, and he focused most of the rage on him and his mother. When the man had nearly beaten his mother to death, Bo stepped in and fought back. He was sure his father was still alive when he left the house, but not 100%. He'd been on the run for over a year, ending up here, finding a job because he had some skill in fixing engines. It was hardly the life he dreamed of. It filled his head with anger and rage. If they had asked him, Bo might have admitted he enjoyed hurting his father. He liked hurting things in general, especially living things. Bo didn't see Sherry again for three days. He was starting to worry when, on the fourth day, he'd been shutting down the garage, closing up, when she came running around the corner. She ran straight into his arms and he realized she was crying. When he lifted her chin up, he saw she had a black eye. Who did this to you? My father. She cried. They made love the first time that very night in the garage office. As they lay there holding each other, Sherry told him how she had violence within her too. She wanted to kill her parents, wanted to burn the entire town down. She had been hurting animals for years, something he related to. I want them dead. I want to get away and kill them all. He comes into my room at night, you know. My dad. He has been since I was 11. Bo felt the rage build then. Something he had felt before, of course. It had been brewing within him since he was a kid. The only time the fury subsided was when he beat his father. Now he was sure he was going to kill Sherry's dad. It turned out her father had a lot of guns. Sure, he had a shitty job with shitty pay, but he sure knew how to spend money on guns instead of food, clothing, and a home for his family. For the next several days, Bo and Sherry spent as much time as they could together. They fucked, and they planned. When the night came, Bo knocked on the family's door. He had Sherry's father's pistol in his belt. When her mother opened the door, he put it right in her face. The rest was a blur. Bo beat her father with the pistol until his face was more blood and pulp than flesh and bone. Sherry stabbed her mother to death, slicing her open and tearing out her insides. Bo put a plastic bag on her little brother's head and tightened it with a zip tie he'd brought from the garage. Sherry's sister went the same way. They took the guns and ran. Sherry's father's car did nicely for a time. When they stopped to get gas the next night, Bo decided it was time to kill again, plus they needed more money. The look on the attendant's face made him smile just thinking about it. So scared, pleading, as if he was sure Bo would change his mind. 
He kept the look on his face right up until Bo put a bullet through his forehead. It pissed Sherry off she missed out on the killing, but she was also proud of Bo. They drove and drove. Bo guessed they were out of Nevada and into Arizona by the next night. No sooner had they crossed the border when they came across a young couple stalled on the side of the road. They were nice, and Bo, with his mechanical skills, soon had the motor running. Sherry stabbed the girl to death on the side of the road, the blood spattering the windshield. Bo knocked the young man down and kicked in his skull with his boots. Then, to be sure they were dead, he put a bullet in each of their heads. They took the couple's car and pocketed the pistol in the glove compartment. Right now, Bo guessed they were in New Mexico. They had managed to go for some time before the need in both of them had gotten too great. Once you started, he mused as he stared into the night, the need just kept coming back. The need to see their faces. Sherry was right, there was something to it, but her need was even greater than his. On the news, they quickly became a sensation. Unfortunately, this meant it plastered their faces all over the television. This made things tricky, but it also meant they had to keep going to people's homes for food and to get more money. And guns. Always, they found guns. Bo discovered the South was a great place for a guy who loved guns. Sure, he had beaten a couple of people to death and stabbed another, but he loved the look in their eyes when you put a pistol in someone's face. He wondered sometimes where they were going. They had no proper plan. Bo and Sherry talked vaguely about trying to get south of the border and find a place to live down in South America. However, getting across the border was going to be almost impossible with their faces everywhere. Bo guessed they'd probably end up dead in a shootout with police or something close to that. Perhaps caught. Then there would be a trial and executions. Bo leaned his front seat back. Behind him, Sherry breathed heavily as she slept. He turned to look at her face. She was such an angel when she was asleep. He worried at times he'd wake up to find she had a gun in his face or perhaps his own knife to his throat. She'd probably find it the ultimate kink to fuck him while he bled out beneath her. With this comforting thought in mind, Bo closed his eyes. He tumbled down a long, dark, dreamless hole into his slumber. Three days later, they finally crossed the state line and found themselves in the panhandle of Texas. The world was suddenly very flat. The sky was bright. The air was hot. For the past three days, they had been driving down some of the roughest roads they had ever seen before. Twice, they had come across police patrols and had to hide the car while waiting them out. The news was still all about them. The car from the two hitchhikers had been found and then the bodies a day later. No one had yet found the massacre in the Jameson house. We need to find another house, Sherry said on the morning of the third day. I gotta get out of this fucking car. You just want to kill someone again, Bo chided. Sherry shrugged and gave him a teasing smile. I am what I am. You know how it makes me horny. I have never met a woman so turned on by blood. Bo laughed, turning left down a gravel road. Beneath them, the bottom of the car was pelted by stones. It was so loud, Sherry turned up the radio. The couple is still considered armed and very dangerous. If anyone sees them, they are to report them to authorities and not try to take them on themselves. That's right. Bo shouted out the window. Don't fuck with us! Sherry laughed. What Bo had not told Sherry was that he was no longer sure where they were going or where they were. She still believed they were heading to South America, but they had been so far off the main roads even Bo wasn't sure where they were going most of the time. The SUV had a compass built into the rearview mirror, but whether or not it was accurate, he couldn't say. Sherry didn't seem to care. It feels like we're the only people in the entire world out here, she said, leaning way out the window and closing her eyes, allowing the wind to rush through her hair. Flat. The world was very flat. Grass and bare batches were everywhere. Sometimes there would be clusters of trees. They would see ranches set far back from the road, with horses or other animals grazing along the grass. None of the ranches appealed to Sherry, though. She wanted something bigger. 
I wish we could find a castle, she said. Might be hard to find in Texas, or New Mexico, or wherever the hell we are. He turned south again as the sun descended. Sherry was quiet, and the radio couldn't pick up any stations. He could tell she was getting restless. They had to find some place to land, he thought. If they didn't, she'd get angry and maybe turn on him. It was like living with a rattlesnake next to him in the passenger seat. Bo turned again, this time heading east down another gravel road. Behind him, he saw the cloud of dust the SUV kicked up behind him. How far could the cops see that? It worried him. Hey, look! Sherry's yell snapped him out of his reverie. He looked where she was pointing and laughed. Son of a bitch. Maybe five miles off to the right was a hill. A goddamn hill in the middle of the flattest part of the country Bo had ever seen, surrounded by thick trees which also looked completely out of place here. A stone wall surrounded the home and a vast tract of land. Behind the stone wall, visible just over the tops of the impossible trees, were spires and peaks. A goddamn castle. We have to go there! Sherry clapped her hands and giggled. <laughs> you bet your ass. Bo began making his way over towards the immense house. As they got closer, they caught different glimpses of the building. It was all stone with slitted windows. Some of the windows appeared made of stained glass like a church. Bo had to keep reminding himself they had taken no drugs and both of them were seeing it. How the hell did this place get way out here? He asked over and over again. It's like a dream. Sherry kept her head out the window, a dreamy look on her face. Maybe we can live here. I could be a princess. Bo laughed. It was impossible. An impossible dream, of course, but he would let her have her fantasy. You're always my princess, sweetheart. They finally reached the stone fence and discovered an iron gate at the main driveway. The road going past the castle was gravel, but the driveway looked like smooth blacktop. The gate was imposing, but it stood open, as if to welcome visitors. Bo brought the SUV to a halt right across the driveway, which wound its way into the copse of trees. From this vantage point, they could see more of the building, although much of it was still hidden by the trees. It was the biggest house Bo had ever witnessed in person. It really is a goddamn castle, baby. He realized he was whispering, speaking in hushed, reverent tones. Do we just drive right up to the place? Sherry asked, her own voice hushed. A eh, place as big as that, they might have servants and shit. We have no idea how many people are in the place. There could be ten people in there. No, we should find a place down the road and hide the car. Sherry smiled and bounced up and down in the seat. We could be a newlywed couple lost in the night and had a breakdown. Bo leaned in and kissed her. You're in my goddamn mind. They laughed and Bo shifted into drive. Bo drove down the road until they were maybe a mile or so away from the vast house. They could see the soft glow of the lights from the castle in the sky along the horizon, but not the house itself. Bo pulled over to the side and they got out, walked around the back of the SUV, and opened the back. What should we bring? Sherry leaned into the back and studied the collection of guns. We should bring knives, of course, but no rifles or shotguns. Bo leaned in and grabbed two pistols. One was a small automatic, which he stuck in his ankle holster. He tucked his switchblade into this front pocket. Then he got the revolver and made sure the chambers were loaded. Sherry grabbed a small automatic, which she tucked away in her jeans. She also grabbed a small flick knife. When she was done, she smiled at Bo, and he leaned in to kiss her. Let's see what this crazy castle in the middle of nowhere is all about, Bo said. They walked back the way they had come, the darkness creeping around them. The sun still painted the sky in the west, but the orb itself was below the horizon. The horizon still held a yellow glow, which slowly descended into darker and darker colors the lower one looked. Bo craned his head up and saw the stars were out, dazzled again by how amazingly bright they were out here in the middle of nowhere. It didn't take them long to get to the open gate. 
The two drifters hooked a left and felt the change from the gravel road to the smooth pavement. Bo kept his eyes ahead, scanning left and right. Sherry was bursting with excitement, nearly skipping, but Bo couldn't quite get excited about things in the same way. He felt like maybe this wasn't real. Maybe they had pushed into another dimension or traveled through a wormhole along the back roads here and were now in England or Scotland. Nothing about this hill or the trees or this castle looked like it belonged. Some force had transported it from some other place, perhaps out of their own imaginations, or Sherry's childish dreams, and placed here. Where there were castles, there were wizards, kings, and sometimes trolls. Bo had read a lot in his days, traveling aimlessly around the country. Many nights, he laid awake on bedbug-infested mattresses and fleabag hotels or motels, reading tattered books to keep himself sane. He loved the tales of hobbits, wizards, and demonic villains. They followed the driveway, first slightly to the right, then to the left. Trees were thick along the pavement, but they could gradually see more and more of the house. It was huge, with many peaks and spires. Lights blazed up and down the towers. Bo had seen nothing like it before. What is this house doing here? He asked aloud. It's amazing. It's a castle, hun. They finally emerged from the long driveway to another paved area. The left was a large wooden door, which could only be the front door. It was the one thing which really looked imposing. No porch light, no window, just an imposing door. I guess that's the door. Bo pointed. I guess we just knock? We're in trouble. Sherry rehearsed. She batted her eyelashes. We need to use your phone, please. No reception out here. Nowhere to turn, please. And the Academy Award goes to... Bo teased. When they reached the door, it took a moment for them to realize where the doorbell was. Bo reached out and twisted a little switch. Inside, distantly, they heard a bell ring. Sherry was so taken with this old-fashioned bell, she gave it a twist, too. Let's not get them angry, sweetie, Bo whispered. Sherry bounced on the balls of her feet. Bo wondered if she was dreaming of a princess in a long gown coming down an equally long staircase, perhaps with a pointed cap and a long veil trailing afterward. The time they stood there grew, and Bo shifted from one foot to the other. He was tempted to ring the bell again, but he didn't want the people inside to be irritated with him from the start. Just as he was about to give up and do it anyway, there was a sound from the other side of the wooden door. Slowly, it creaked open. Hello? The voice was female, and Beau realized there was a hint of an accent. Funny, he thought, how just one small word could reveal so much about a person. Hi there. Bo said, putting on his most charming and winning smile. I apologize for ringing your bell at night like this, but our car broke down just up the road there. We can't get any reception on the cell phones, and uh, we saw your lights on. Is there any chance we can use your phone? The door opened further, and a tall, pale woman with dark hair down to her shoulders came into view. She was dressed in a white blouse and a dark skirt. Her clothes looked expensive to Beau, but he didn't know much about these things. I'm so sorry to hear that, she said, looking concerned. James, did you hear that? From within the hallway, hidden back among some shadows, a man appeared. He was dressed in gray pants and a white dress shirt. He had short, well-combed black hair. I did. What a shame. Yes, of course, you can come in. The man opened the door further. Inside was a thick carpet and soft lighting. The foyer hallway opened into a large interior room with what appeared to be a balcony overlooking it. The sense of hugeness about the place only increased as Bo and Sherry took their first hesitant steps inside. Thank you, Bo said. Sorry to interrupt. The dark-haired woman smiled warmly. Not at all. Please do come in. Bo finally realized they had English accents, which seemed just as out of place as the castle itself. 
The sensation of having stepped out of the normal reality into another plane of existence hit Bo again. He had read about such things and couldn't help but wonder if he was experiencing it. My name is Rick. Bo lied. This is my wife, Darlene. You live in a castle? Sherry squealed with delight. The young man with dark hair laughed. My name is James. This is my sister Lily. It's not quite a castle, but close. You'll forgive me for asking. Bo looked around, unable to stop himself from gaping in awe at the high ceilings, expensive-looking paintings on the wall, and the seemingly endless marble floors. How in the hell did you find a place like this in Texas? Lily and James laughed again. Lily spoke up first. Well, this entire area was built by our father. He had a job opportunity here in Texas right after we were born. He turned this entire area into a semblance of the English countryside. He built the hill, planted the trees. Then he transported our home across the ocean a bit at a time to have it rebuilt here. Bo whistled in appreciation. He felt his palms start to itch, always a sign he wanted to commit violence and rob. It was very tempting to just pull out his gun and shoot these two. The blood would look amazing across the walls and marble floor. Lily and James cast quick glances at one another. We were just about to sit down to dinner, James said. You two look like you've been traveling for a long time. Would you care to join us? We wouldn't mind the company. Bo's instincts kicked and he was about to say no when Sherry squealed in delight again. We'd love to. I've never eaten in a castle before. Hell, I've never even seen such a thing up close. Bo cleared his throat. Well, whatever the wife wants, she gets. If it isn't too much trouble, we'd love to join you. James extended a hand toward the interior of the house. Right this way. We hope you don't mind, but it's just us tonight. We gave the staff the night off. This was good news, Bo thought. Sherry reached out her hand and squeezed his tightly. It had been quite a while since she had been this excited. The group walked into a grand hallway and then into a large room with one wall dominated by a huge painting. It was some guy in a frilly outfit and Bo had no idea who it was. In front of them was the biggest dining room table he had ever seen. There were flowers and candles there. Overhead was an ornate chandelier. There was food everywhere, too. All sorts of meats, a big pot of soup, and side dishes Bo didn't recognize. Please have a seat, James said, indicating the table. Lily will get extra plates. Our staff created this magnificent dinner for us before leaving. They always create too much. Would you like some wine? Sherry was already sitting at a place, and she nodded enthusiastically. Bo was cautious, but also sat down next to his girl. He tried to convey to her that something isn't quite right about this. His instincts were honed more than hers. He had spent time in jail, and there were things you picked up there to warn you of danger. James produced two glasses, which he sat down in front of them. He poured from a decanter, and rich red wine flowed into the glass. The smell of it intoxicated Beau. Just as James finished, Lily arrived with plates and silverware. She set those down in front of Beau and Sherry. This is a little informal, she admonished herself. Forgive us, we weren't expecting company, but we're so glad you're here. Please, help yourselves. Sherry reached across the table and grabbed chicken off a plate which had been carved into neat slices next to the carcass. She also grabbed potatoes and some sort of vegetable dish. Bo took a sip of his wine. In the past, Bo had tried all sorts of alcohol. Mostly, had they pressed him, he would have said he was a fan of bourbon and whiskey. He had never particularly liked wine, but this wine was something unlike any he had tried before. Bitter, yes, but also smooth, with flavors that linger on his tongue once he swallowed. He took a longer sip. This is the best wine I've ever tasted, he said, and only once the words had left his mouth did he realize he had spoken aloud. Lily and James laughed. The brother and sister sat across the table. James lifted a fork of dark meat into his mouth. He chewed with an odd relish that once again set Bo on edge. To him, it was like watching a predator devour its prey. Bo felt a weird desire to run. 
there was riches galore around them. If Bo and Sherry were to murder these two right now, just the silverware they were using for their meals would be enough to pay to get them across the border. Bo knew a few people who could get them fake passports. They would get real disguises, which would fool authorities. There were ways to get anywhere if you tried hard enough, and had enough cash. The feeling in his gut was too much to deny. Something about the way the siblings stared at them while Sherry ate and Bo drank. Something was off inside this grand castle, transported brick by brick across the Atlantic and set up in this middle of nowhere place in Texas. So, where are you two from? Lily asked, sipping her own wine. Shiri talked with her mouth full. I'm from California, Bo's from New York. We met a few years ago and got married last year. Bo was impressed with her ability to improvise. He knew her well enough to guess this had been the fantasy in her head since she was a little girl. Sherry was the type with Hollywood dreams and thoughts of a dashing prince from a big city coming to take her away to some faraway enchanted land. I work with my hands mostly. Bo extended both palms toward them. Why had he done that? To show them as calluses? I love cars and get by working on them. I'm pretty good. He was talking too much, he chided himself. Bo took another sip of his wine, then reached across to grab a drumstick off the chicken carcass. That's a skill I wish I had, James admitted. I am useless with my hands. Father always wanted me to go to college, become a lawyer, or enter politics. Sherry took a large gulp of her wine. She coughed, then laughed. Excuse me, I'm not used to wine. Bo laughed. Neither of us are, I guess. What brings you two to Texas? Lily asked, an odd light in her eyes, a strange smile hanging on her lips. We're on a vacation. Well, we never got a chance to have a honeymoon. Sherry filled in the story. Bo let her run with it. We both got some time off and got into the car, just started driving. Bo turned his head to look around the room and the colors of the walls, the carpeting, and lights blurred together as he did so. Weird. He had felt like this before. Where had it been? Bo took another bite of the chicken, chewed, swallowed. Sherry ate her food, but she had begun to slow down too. She took another drink of her wine. She turned her head to look at Bo a moment later, a curious expression on her face. I feel weird, she said. Bo's red alerts went off in his brain. Too late, he thought. It's all too late. You should have run. He stood up suddenly, nearly falling over, his feet caught in the legs of the chair. What did you do to us? Was what he tried to say. Instead, it came out more like, What did you do to... Lily and James looked at each other and smiled. Whatever do you mean? James asked. I think maybe you cannot handle your wine, as you said. Bo tried to reach for his gun as Sherry attempted to stand. She got halfway there, muttered something under her breath, then fell hard to the thick carpet. Bo's fingers wouldn't work, and the world felt as if it had tipped hard to the left. He staggered sideways, the gun tumbled to the ground. No, he whispered. Then he fell, and darkness took him before he hit the floor. <sighs> Bo's tongue felt thick and covered in carpeting. He licked his lips. They were dry, too. His head pounded like something alive behind his eyes. The world still spun a bit too fast. He tried to talk some more. What <sighs> Slowly, he tried to open his eyes, but the world was too bright. There were dots of color against a brown background in front of him. What? He repeated. There was movement behind him. He tried to turn his head, but the world whipped around too wildly, and he turned his head back straight again. Focus, he thought, through the weirdness and muddled feeling. What are the dots of color? Birds. What? He had to expand his vocabulary. So far, he could only seem to say the word what. However, it was the only word he could think of to say. 
It was a bright orange bird, very dead, held to the wooden wall with barbed wire. Next to it was another bird, this one blue, also held in place with barbed wire. Then another bird, this one just brown and white, also held into place the same way. Now he turned his head to the left and saw more of them all around the room. Oh, fuck, he whispered. Do you like my decorations? The voice made Bo jump. When he did, it was then he realized someone had tied him to a wooden chair. Leather belts held his wrists to the arms of the chair. One belt across his chest and more belts at his wrists. There were more straps across his legs and ankles. The voice was behind him, female. It all came back to Bo in a rush. The weird castle house, the strange brother and sister, the meal and the wine, falling. It was the sister behind him, her English accent strangely muffled. Let me go. God damn it, I'm gonna fucking kill you. Let me out of here. If you let me go and let Sherry go, we'll just leave. If you hurt me or her, you and your fucking brother are dead. She laughed. He heard footsteps behind him. Where the hell was he? There was a small window way off to the left, letting in a bit of light. Was it morning already? Overhead were exposed wooden beams. The floor was also wood. It was hot. It was an attic. Bo had been in enough of those to know where he was. You are hardly in a position to make demands. She walked closer to him. He felt her against his right shoulder. Bo. She leaned down and put her face right into his. However, she was wearing a mask. It was white, stiff, almost looking as if it were made of porcelain. There were two slits for her eyes and a slight bump for her nose, but no hole for her mouth. Red dots adorned the cheeks just below each eye. Her long, dark hair cascaded down over the sides of this white face and down her back. Yes, I checked your wallet, and I knew from the moment I saw you. Bo saw she held his pistol in her right hand. See, you have nothing to threaten me with. You're fucking crazy. She walked in front of him. She wore a long, flowing robe covered with a floral design. Now that he was awake, Bo took in more of the room. There were other animals on the walls, also held in place by barbed wire. A squirrel, a cat, a groundhog. Then, over to the right, was something spread out across the wall like a bearskin rug hung up instead of spread out on the floor. Except it wasn't bearskin. Was it a human? Oh, Jesus. Bo strained against the straps. They flexed, but did not give. It was quite a surprise. We have had quite a few visitors over the years. My brother and I welcome them. We feed them. Then we play with them. We seldom get celebrities such as you and Miss Berlin. This is quite the honor. We're very excited. She laughed in a high-pitched way, which made Bo think of a deranged little girl. Where was Sherry? Where's Sherry? Oh, James is playing with her. I always get the boys. He likes the girls. Sometimes we switch. It all depends on how long our playmates like to keep playing. This is fucked up. Look, turn us into the police. You can get a reward. Lily laughed. <laughs> You're funny. So tell me, what was it like? Bo was momentarily confused. What? <laughs> that seems to be your favorite word this morning. Killing all of those people so fast. Uh, so many at once. I heard on the news this morning they found an entire family dead today. Of course, they're blaming you. Did you do it? There seemed little point in lying now. <sighs> yes. Oh, children, too. James and I have never done such a thing. What is that like? It's the most amazing feeling in the world. Why was he telling her this? It was as if he couldn't stop his own tongue from blabbing. It's like being a god. It's finally having control over the world around you, and when you see the fear in their eyes, it's like being drunk. Almost like you can drink it in. Lily nodded. Yes, I understand. She turned back around, and he couldn't see what she was doing any longer. 
There was a sort of bench affixed to the wall, and he heard what sounded like metal clinking together. When she faced him again, she held a small silver instrument in her right hand. In a flash, Bo barely registered. She slashed across his face, and he felt the blood run down his cheek before the pain hit. Bo screamed. He tasted blood. Something wet flapped against his cheek. Was it the upper part of his face? Lovely, Lily said. I always start with something simple. I want to hear what the screams sound like. You have a lovely scream. You fucking bitch! I'm gonna kill you. I swear to God, I'm gonna kill you with my bare hands. Lily laughed again, turning back to her table. This time, when she whirled around towards him again, yet another shiny thing flashed in her hand. It was a small plastic box with a clear or reflective top that caught the light. The light from the window caught additional flickers of something inside. Have you ever had anything under your fingernails before? It hurts so much, like a paper cut. She held the box close to his face. It was a box full of needles and pins. Let's see how you do with these. Sherry's eyes snapped open. She flinched at the light and immediately knew she was tied down to a table. There were straps across her chest, stomach, and legs. Plus, her hands were strapped to the sides of the table. She also quickly realized the table below her was metal, and she was just in a bra and panties. Well, well. Good morning. Whose voice was that? She turned her head and saw a man's back. Wearing a white shirt, hunched over a table, he wasn't looking at her. She could just barely see the black hair on top of his head. James? It all came crashing back to her in a rush. The castle, the weird brother and sister, the food and the wine. She remembered falling. James, what are you doing? Let me go. James stood up straight, and Sherry realized just how tall he was and how muscular he was beneath his white shirt. He had been wearing an ill-fitting suit across his body the night before. There was some kind of plastic strap across the back of his head. When he turned around, Sherry felt real, true, intense fear. James wore a white mask with black slits for his eyes. Black lines ran down from both eyes to the chin. There was just a small bump for a nose and no mouth hole. When he looked at her, he cocked his head to the side as if studying her. Hello, Sherry. James laughed. How did he know her real name? Were they that famous? Sherry tried to strain against the straps which held her. They held her tight, and there was no going anywhere. My sister and I knew who you were the moment you walked into our house. James turned back around to his table. Sherry heard the soft clinking of metal. We weren't expecting you, of course. We keep the lights on and hope someone ends up off the trail, perhaps lost and looking for a warm light in a window. You'd be surprised how often it happens, even more so at how often it's a couple. Lovers. Sherry looked straight up. All she could see was an intense light as bright as the sun. She looked left. Smooth, concrete walls. She could see just a fraction of the floor, but it was smooth concrete as well. Sherry felt around the table with her hand the best she could. It was smooth metal for sure, but there was also an odd channel along both sides. Not very wide or deep, but there was one on each side. Why are you doing this? She asked, trying to keep her voice calm. James didn't bother to turn around this time. Why do you and Bo do what you do? Sherry was confused for a moment. We love each other. So you slaughter entire families in one night because of love. James laughed, the sound strange and echoey through the mask. I want to know why you killed a mother, father, and two kids. Why did you slaughter your own family? My father was abusing me. Sherry couldn't stop her eyes from darting around. It was so dark outside of the cone of light created by the lamp above her head, and she searched for something to offer hope. My mother let it happen. James stood up straight again. When he turned around, he held something shiny in his hand. Then why did you kill your brother and sister? 
Sherry opened her mouth to speak, but couldn't find the words. She licked her lips. Because it was fun. It was the first time she had admitted it. She could remember her brother and sister trying to get away from her clawed, bloody hands, screaming, crying, begging. It had been such a rush for her. She felt powerful for the first time in her life. When Sherry saw herself in their eyes, she saw someone to be feared, not the tiny girl her father liked to touch or hit depending on how much he had to drink. That is the truth. James stepped forward. Sherry saw he held a large needle in his hand. I like hearing the truth. My sister and I agree with that sentiment. We enjoy it too, but we're connoisseurs. You and Beau seem to want to shoot the entire world in some insane orgy of violence. Tell me, what do you imagine the end result of your spree will be? At some point, the police will catch up to you. Will there be a roadblock? Some grand shootout where you and your love died in a hell of bullets? No, we're going to South America. We're getting away. Please, let me go. Let us go and we'll leave. She suddenly realized Beau was not in the room with her. Wait, where's Bo? James walked toward the end of the table where her feet were. Oh, Bo is having playtime with my sister. She has the attic as her playroom. I got the basement. She likes animals and decorating. I prefer to keep things clean and neat. He paused as if thinking. Mostly. James ran his hand down her right leg. It was then Sherry realized he was wearing black vinyl gloves on each hand. The weird sensation went down her leg, over her knee. He paused at the ankle where the strap held her, then continued to touch her bare foot all the way to the toe. Sherry shivered against the table. It was like being touched by a slug. Now, Sherry, I need more truth from you. You know the police have the borders blocked. There's no way for you and Bo to get out of the country. Tell me the real ending to your story. Sherry felt like throwing up. She wanted to scream. I don't know. James made an odd sound behind his mask. It took a moment for Sherry to realize he was making tisk-tisk sounds. Well then, this is really going to hurt. He said, his English accent so smooth and almost soothing. But that's okay. Pain purifies. You can find a lot of truth in pain. Sherry cried out. James's hand clutched her foot harder, his fingers like a vice. Wait, please! Then the real pain started, and all words were lost to her. What happens when two very deranged people meet something even more evil than themselves? Find out what will happen to these young lovers in the season finale of When the Night Comes Out. You've been listening to When the Night Comes Out, a weekly horror anthology podcast with stories by Brian W. Alaspa and narrated by Ali James. For Brian's work, visit his website at www.brianwalaspa.com or visit amazon.com for his books of fiction and nonfiction. Be sure to listen to Ali's work on Facebook at Ali James Projects.